with this first question, which I guess is a little bit personal, but I'll start with it because I know a lot of you had this on your mind. Uh, Jennifer and David Auker, would you tell us your signature stories, please, each of you? Thank you. You want me to start? Yep. Well, in, in the middle 80s, I was teaching strategy at Berkeley, and I'd written a book on strategy. And uh, it, I came to realize that, that people were too focused on short-term profits and driven by the stock market and, and um, others. N not to blame Rich for th that, but uh, he was one of them. Uh, he was part of the evil uh, empire. But uh, um, yeah, I, I, gee, I'm tempted to tell. I used to, when I was side by side with him, I used to go over and say, you know, if I spent so much time with students, I could win the Best Teacher Award, too. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so I said, how, how can I do this? How can I influence this? And I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my career teaching people to manage for the long term, which to me meant to build assets instead of driving short-term financials. And so I said, what, what kind of asset should I do? And, and uh, given my background, and I had background in market research, in strategy, and in advertising, and, uh, and also I uh, realized that brand equity was starting to be, become uh, a topic of conversation, and I thought it, it should be brands. That's where I fit. And, uh, and I looked at other kinds of assets of a firm, and, and I wasn't very relevant to any of them. So I decided to help people uh, build brands as a way to, to focus on assets instead of financials. And um, so I kind of grandiosely said, I'm going to try to change the way people think of marketing and the way they think of brands and the way they run their business. And uh, you know, I would be embarrassed to, to say that then, but now I'm older, who cares? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's how I started in branding. I wrote my first book sort of defining brand equity and my second book on how do you manage brand equity. And since then, I continue to write branding books and be really focused on, on that basic problem, how to get people to think more strategically. That's fantastic. Um, I would say my equivalent of that one would be, um, I never wanted to be in marketing. So I... So you're implying you now are in marketing? No, I'm still not. In, I'm, I'm even less in marketing than I ever was. But my goal was to always be a great, hopefully, um, a great mom, hopefully a great partner. Um, Andy, this is where you say, you're like, yes, nailed it. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to be a great friend, uh, hopefully an athlete, and, and hopefully contribute back to something in the world, um, and wanted to do great in my career, but I just didn't know what it was. And I think, you know, when you talk to executives, anyone, um, you find out that a lot of people have closet careers. Like, they always wanted to be this, but they didn't know how or whatever. And so for me, that closet career was to be an oncologist. Um, you know, my mom's um, father, my grandfather, died of cancer at an early age. She's worked for hospice now for, gosh, 40 years, um, Meals on Wheels, um, with um, others in the room. And it just had a personal impact, even though I didn't see it personally. But I think all of us have been touched by cancer. And so um, that was what was really important to me. But I couldn't see my way to being an oncologist, but also having these others goals to be, you know, all of these other things. And so um, I saw my dad be this remarkable dad uh, who ha was so good with time management and so fantastic with ideas and science. And, um, I, you know, I just I thought it was so inspirational. So that's why I became a behavioral scientist. And so, um, but every Sunday I would feel a little bit depressed. I don't know how many of you guys on Sundays or like one day a week, you just get kind of get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and I try like 10 years depression on Sundays. Like I saw it coming, it hit, it was consistent. And I thought, you know, is it that I have a lack of friends? <laughs> is it that I, you know, what is it? 
And I, but it had something to do with meaning for me. I just felt not very connected to something that was truly meaningful. So, um, so fast forward, I got recruited back to Stanford. I was lucky enough to join Berkeley for two years. And thank you for those of you who took my class and are here. You mean a lot to me. Um, I have a deep, deep love for uh, Berkeley and, and, and bears. And, um, but then I went back to Stanford. Um, but um, um, I do have a, a feeling of a kind of what's right for me. And when I came back to Stanford, which felt very right for me, um, at the time, I had the opportunity to basically um, really resonate with a story that Robert Chatwani, a Haas MBA, shared with me on the last day of my class, which was called Creativity and Innovation. And in this story, he told, um, I told about his, his best friend, Samir, many of you guys know this story, um, who had leukemia. And Robert, because he's so strategic, so creative, so confidence without attitude, he was able to come up with a framework, a way of thinking about harnessing story and social media to get over 25,000 people in the bone marrow registry in order to find a perfect match for Samir, and he did that. And it was just such a mesmerizing story for me that, um, that Andy and I, I I went back that night and actually shared with him the story, and we ended up writing a book based on it. And I never wanted to write a book. That was Dad's thing. And, um, but it literally felt compelled to me. And, um, and, and I could go on and on about the reverberating effects of that signature story. But um, even though I never became an oncologist, I felt like donating a year of my life to try and get more people in the bone marrow registry and still now really feeling connected to that very meaningful thing, A, I no longer have empty Sundays. I feel very full on Sundays. Um, and B, we have this book, which is why you wrote so many of your books that, you know, you know, it creates legacy, it creates meaning. And so that's one of my signature stories. And I have so many more too, but um, hopefully you'll all be thinking of like, in every domain of your life, one signature story that really defines you. And if you haven't yet, please do so tonight. It would make us incredibly happy just even writing it down with six words or less, just the title, and then sharing it with your, your loved ones. That would, that would be a big successful night. All right, so I'm going to jump in and ask a couple of questions. Um, all right, so um, let's see. How do you create a po powerful personal story when you're working in an ordinary job? I don't know if Marissa is here, but Marissa asked that question that Dad loved. So I'm going to ask it to you. Uh, I don't think this is how it works. We both answer these questions. But well, anyway, I will, I'll, if I'll, I have something interesting yeah. to say. Anyway, uh, um, well, I think that uh, if you're in a position in an organization to, to create a higher purpose or to maybe activate a higher purpose that is in the organization by creating a program or, or something, then you should do that. I think that... Uh, uh, you know, that, that it, it just provides meaning in the lives of employees, and it provides respect for the, the people that do business with the organization. But if you're not in a position to do that, you know, you might consider uh, having another life, another professional life as a volunteer, perhaps, with an organization that does have a higher purpose that you really admire. I totally disagree. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think that was a great answer. I see why you put that first, because you wanted to talk about purpose. It, you know, basically, you're going to fit that in. Well, I was just trying to help you out, because purpose is kind of your thing now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After carving out clear areas of incompetence, oh. it will be my thing. Um, it's true. Um, I teach a class uh, with Emily Ma um, at, at, at X, Google X, and um, it's called Rethinking Purpose. The other thing I would add to, to that, um, that answer is that a lot of times, there's, in fact, there's data by Gallup and others that show that, um, at least in the United States, uh, over 50% of the people working at their institutions don't understand um, the purpose of their institution or their mission. Uh, and of those that do, 80% don't care. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's just huge data sets, and it's a starkly, um, you know, depressing, you know, trend. So what happens if you're at this ordinary job and there's no sort of higher purpose there? Um, what, 
one interesting thing about the purpose research is that um, purpose oftentimes is thought of as this like, you know, purpose with a big capital P, but it actually is a lowercase p oftentimes. And so everyone thinks it's sort of this destination, this inspired mission. I wanted to be an oncologist. I'm going to make a dent in cancer. But more often than not, purpose is um, designed much more from this lowercase p perspective. It's what you're doing in the day to day. Um, are you learning? Do you feel like you're accessing some unique strengths? Are you um, passionate about your, what you're doing? And do you feel like what you're doing is what the world needs? And those are the elements that get you into flow. Um, that and whether you really like the people you're working with or at least have one best friend um, at your organization. And so if you can just kind of get into that sort of lowercase p mentality, that will often ride you out. Um, OK. I'm going to have another question. What advice do you have for individuals and organizations faced with the rival who generates powerful stories that are patently untrue? This is Steve's question. Well, uh, I, I'm a great believer that you know the best story wins and the, the last heard story wins. So you've got to really change the conversation. I think you need to create your own signature story and and uh, and make that more prominent than this this one that is. You know, if, if you look at uh, uh, Walmart, for example, there was a time where 9% of the world wouldn't even shop at Walmart because they were so disgusted with a lot of their policies. And then Walmart created this, this alternative conversation. They sort of uh, went green. They got religion about environmental things. They're doing enormous stuff on that. They, they uh, are working with the community, and, uh, and they really... Uh, provided at least an alternate conversation. At least when you talk about Walmart, you don't have to talk about how they treat their employees and how they buy from China and, and how they treat their suppliers and so on. There's an, uh, as an option. So I think you have to create a competitive strategic story or a signature story that, that, uh, uh, that wins the day against the, the one that's false. Totally disagree. I'm just kidding. Um, another way to think about it is um, listening better to what that story is and the language that's being used by that um, competitor or the audience. And I've been thinking a lot about this right now. It feels like we're living in a, a relatively div uh, divisive world. Um, one reason, one of the many reasons we're so happy to be here today is not just because of our deep love for Rich and um, and also you know what Haas has been able to. Um, I think, create for you and also for us more generally, but also um, this, this also this, this ability to bridge Stanford and Berkeley. It's, it's a very, you know, sort of small, divisive, you know, kind of funny, um, you know, competitive environment, but it's, it's still very gratifying to be able to make these sort of small dents. When you're in divisive environments where there's, um, it's not clear what's truth and what's not, when there's um, different people and, and, and organizations and groups that have alternative narratives that are very stuck in their head, all of us. Um, it, what I find to be interesting and, and useful, and then it's backed by um, a significant amount of social science as well, is understanding and feeling empathy for individuals who have a very different narrative, even if it's patently, patently false. And understanding the language that they're using, where they're coming from, and so, um, and before you potentially design a counter narrative. Um, and so, understanding, having empathy, and understanding language, and then aligning where there's some common thread feels to be, to me, um, quite inspiring and hopeful. Do we have time for another question, Rich? OK. Um, I'm just going to. All right, I'm going with James Tinsley. How have signature stories changed in recent years? Are we telling the same stories through different media? Or are we telling fundamentally different stories? I can go if you don't. You go okay. ahead. <laughs> 
Um, I thought this was such an interesting question, and the reason is because I think we're, because we're living in such a trust deficit, um, and that stories and, and people that you trust is so important, authenticity is at such a premium. And um, I know it's an overused kind of trendy word in many regards, but there's something really important about uh, stories that not only um, are authentic, but they feel authentic. And I think that's a really significant trend that's happening. It's not a qualitatively different type of story per se, but it has implications. Like, you know, is it always going to be pretty, 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 like most marketing or manufactured, you know, goods? Or is there going to be some highs and lows? Look at the dad story that dad shared. You know, it wasn't like happy, 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 right? There was some highs and there was lows. Um, a second, I think, uh, shift is that I think people need to design for partners more that you need to feel like you're part of a story. So it's not just like, I'm going to share with you a story and you're going to receive it. But if you feel part of the story, uh, and this is what Dragonfly and Robert Chawani's story was all about, if you feel part of it, then you'll get people aligned. And if you get people aligned and they feel part of the story, you can actually make action happen. And, um, and I think we're all living in a world right now where it's very important for us to be aligned at, at what um, is good in the world and how we can make action toward that, what we believe in, and, and how we can make progress happen uh, together. There's a phrase that um, I'll just end with, which is people want to be uh, valued members of a winning team on an inspired mission. And you don't have to be winning all the time, but um, have you heard this before? Um, but you need to have a pathway toward winning. And I like that sentence because you have to have clarity and that inspired mission. You have to have people knowing what role on the team do they have. I think another uh, uh, really important thing in the branding world is energy. And we know that brands have been declining for 15 years all around the world. The exception are those brands with energy. And it's really hard to get energy into a brand. And one of the reasons that we, a practical reason we want a higher purpose is because they will give energy to the brand. You look at Lifebuoy, I mean, they make bar soap. It is pretty hard to create energy for bar soap, but help a child reach five and uh, three videos that got 44 million exposures, that's energy. And, and, it, and it gives life to, uh, to one of the great global brands, which is Lifebuoy. Um, fantastic. We have one last question. Um, how do you create a six-word story or any signature story? This is Linda. Uh, I have nothing to say about that. Okay. All right. Um, one thing I would, I don't know if Linda's here, but um, what I would say is you're always thinking about change or transformation. So think about your life. You know, what, what did you used to be and what are you now? So how did you sort of change? And that, that usually gets you away from like, I am this, I do this, I'm going to do this, et cetera, that kind of linear progression. As you start to figure out signature stories, you know, baby shoes, for sale, never worn, there's an arc to it. And there is kind of a reveal to it. Um, and so think of, of, of transformation and change. And I think right now, again, I think all of us really um, <coughs> Are, are, are in a stronger place if we're adaptable, if we're open to change, and we're able to transform. So that would be my one tip. Thank you. Please join me in thanking these two wonderful friends and scholars of all of us. Thank you. Thank you both. You know, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago that I saw Jennifer and, and we, this idea came up and we thought, oh, if we could only get you two together and I'm so happy we were able to make this happen. Um, when, I was, when I was seven, my brothers were 14 and 15. And one of the things I remember so distinctly is my parents driving us to Half Moon Bay. We had one of those woody station wagons and, and we filled it with pumpkins. It was early, early October. And we brought those pumpkins back to our home. And our parents let us sell those pumpkins. We had a, a stand in front of the neighborhood, and we sold those pumpkins. And, and that was a thrill for me. That was a thrill for me. And two years later, I may have been about nine, and my brothers were 
near the end of high school, we had graduated to jewelry. We, we were, they were in the puka shell business. Uh, <laughs> high volume, low margin. I was seven years younger, I didn't like the business. I was doing tiger eye, turquoise, much higher priced, higher quality stuff. And, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I got to go to Berkeley as an undergrad, and I come from a business family, if you hadn't noticed from those stories, and I wanted to go into business, and I knew it thrilled me. Uh, I was a sophomore, and I'd taken intermediate macroeconomics at Berkeley, and one of my faculty, one of the faculty members, the teacher, I'd never talked to her one-on-one, -on -one. she comes up to me after handing back the midterm, and I, I had done pretty well in the midterm, and she said, come see me, please, in my office, and I went to go see her. Her name is Fran Van Lu. and she said, have you ever thought about getting a PhD in economics? Neither of my parents had a four-year degree. That was not an identity I'd ever even thought about. And I walked out of her office never having thought about that. A um, Couple weeks later, she got me together with somebody named George Akerlof. I didn't know who George Akerlof was. He subsequently won a Nobel Prize. But she wanted me to sort of talk to somebody who had done that. And we can't be what we can't see. So when people ask me, why does this institution mean so much to you? You know, that's, that's my story. And I think a lot of us have a story like that, whether your story is connected to Stanford or Berkeley or, you know, these institutions matter. And it's why we're so invested in them. It's why we come together around them. And that's part of why we keep them strong and we must keep them strong. So uh, whichever of those two institutions you're part of, keep leaning into them because they just matter so much. Thanks for coming out tonight. Go Bears.